welcome to our uh, leadership studio here. Uh, another great, great hour about nonprofit leadership. And uh, uh, I want to thank Shay, Professor Everett, for uh, filling in for me for two weeks while I was away in Denmark and Sweden. It was, it was a hard time for me, I assure you, but it's good to be back. And we have a great guest, uh, one of the leaders here in the city of Houston, uh, Council Member Jerry Davis. Uh, Jerry, how you doing, man? I'm doing great. It's wonderful to be, there, be here at University of Houston downtown. Yes, exactly. And so uh, I wanted to bring you on because you're a very unique leader, <laughs> especially as it relates to nonprofit management, right? Because not only are you a uh, leader within the city, and city council member, but you've also started your own nonprofit. Yes, uh, you've been part of a, uh, a very fruitful business that everyone knows about, the Breakfast Club here in Houston. Uh, so I want to talk about how all that okay. goes together. But let me start with uh, a question that I often ask. So, so let's say we're doing the Jerry Davis book on leadership, right? This is the guide, the Jerry Davis guide to leadership. What are some of the key chapters for you in leadership? What are some of the most important co components of leadership? Well, for me, um, I would say, the, for me, the key uh, chapter is going to be communication. Mm. Um, that is one critical aspect in life in general. Yeah. Um, but anytime you're building relationships with people, uh, you have to have uh, great communication um, skills. If you don't, uh, it's kind of like sending the text out. Yeah. You know, if you don't hear it come from me, you don't know in the manner it's being sent. And so right. you're reading it and you, you have like five or ten things that you might be to think about. So we want to have effective communication skills. That's, that's the first one. Another one is um, as you get ready to move forward with your vision is your planning. Yep. Again, and this is for me. Yep. Um, I have to plan. And in college, I was a last minute uh, study a crammer. Um, but it doesn't work that way now when you're dealing with other people. And so when you, they want, some people want to be guided in a proper manner. Yeah. Some people want to know what's out there um, and so how they can um, plan their life accordingly, if you will. Yeah. So yeah. those are two uh, chapters that, that I would say you, you, that would be in my book. So communication and planning. Yes, sir. A lot of times as we talk to leaders, especially nonprofit leaders, they talk about passion. How important is that for you when you started your nonprofit, uh, making it, uh, making it better, it better uh, and in city council, this whole idea of passion, do you see differences there? Well, yeah, I'll tell you, the only time it really makes a difference in the name for, for me from, is, is when they're writing a check for the yeah. nonprofit. You can call it making it better, making it happen, making a difference, uh, <laughs> make the world better. It's, it's all just, good. When you have a check, it says making it better sometimes. But anyway, no, uh, question again? So is there a difference in that yeah, passion? passion? Passion. So yes, I will say that uh, for a brief period of time, I I felt like I've I had a job. Mm -hmm. That was when I sold insurance. Mm. But beyond that, I do not feel that I've had a job because I'm passionate about what I do. Yeah. And uh, me being a city council member, um, as well as the vice mayor pro tem of the city of Houston, um, the attribute of giving and sharing and teaching, I shared that in, within the nonprofit when we began. Uh, I started when I wanted to just help out kids that would look like me or lived from, came from a neighborhood that, that was very similar to mine. Mm -hmm. And if I can do certain things, my question was, well, why can't they? Mm -hmm. And so we began to fill in the gap with certain things and that's what making it better. It was their circumstances. Yeah. And so passion is needed again. I don't feel like I'm working even to this day because I believe as a city council member, the work that I do is um, it coincides to a mission, if you yeah. will. Yeah. So passion is definitely needed. If not, you're going to be frustrated when um, you're looking at your budget. You're going to be frustrated when people tell you no when you ask them. Right. Uh, you're going to be frustrated when sometimes the out outcomes that you're expecting, you don't get them. Yep. And so when you're passionate about it, you're going to continue to roll up your sleeves and go to the next person ask for another check, go to the next child or continue with that same child and try to make sure that they get the resources that they need. Yeah. 
One of the things that happened um, this year in Houston is we had these big floods, especially up on the north side. And and is that was that your district? Is that uh, because I turned on the TV and I saw my buddy Jerry Davis out there <laughs> uh, wading in the water, and and I wondered, is that your district? Your yeah, Greens, yeah, so Greenspoint is a yeah. part of District B. It, it starts in Fifth Ward. Um, Right at I-10 and 59, yeah. head north up um, 59, passing Cashmere Gardens, Trinity Gardens, Northwood Manor, and then the airport, and then you make a left on the Beltway right there, so, Greens Point. So, so I want to know, what, what prompted you, and was it passion that prompted you? Was it just sort of instinct to, to go out there and, and start helping some of those neighbors? I mean, what, what made you think, as you, as you started seeing the flooding, what made you think, I'm going to go out there and help out? So, so it was a, a, a bunch of things. Yeah. Um, when Even going back to Memorial Day floods 2015, and I believe we just came from, a, my son and I just came from a basketball game and, uh, at the Toyota Center, and we drove back the back streets because everything else was flooded. But if you took Fifth Ward to Cashmere Gardens right there where we live, yeah. no problems. And so it continued to rain. So the next day we popped up, got in my wife's truck, and we looked at certain areas. Uh, again, Halloween 2015, same thing. Yeah. And so now, uh, because of my district, sometimes they feel like they don't get everything they need. And so when something happens in the area, they tend not to call and report sure. because they say, mm, it doesn't no matter. Gonna, no one's going to help me. Yeah. And so well, one of the things I wanted to do was go out and chronicle certain spots throughout my district. And so this one, um, at the tax day flood, April 18th, we started out, I started out in Kashmir, headed up to Northwood Manor, areas that I've, I've identified in the past. Yeah. And they were pretty much light. Then I crossed over down Little York over to Acres Homes. Yeah. We looked at a couple of streets off of DeSoto problems. And then uh, we were heading up to Greens Point. But I'll tell you, no one ever thought about Greens Point because it has not been a problematic right. area. So I received a few phone calls from my, off, from my office, and um, they, they told me you need to get out to Greens Point. It's some things. And then I also received a phone call from one of our reporters, uh, and he said, hey, council member, if you don't know, you need to come out to Greens Point. Mm -hmm. And so I said, when I can make my way through Greens Point, I'll get, get down there. So we went down there, and I had my son with me again yeah, yeah. Uh, because it's about <clears throat> giving back and yep. he, understanding what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. We began to walk through the flood to those specific area that was being reported. And next thing you know, I had to put my son on my back because the water was hitting my chest and he's only 5'2", so it was at his neck. And so we continued back to the area and we began to just look at well, and assess yeah. the situation. And we made phone calls, to, uh, communicated with the mayor that day. And he uh, ended up coming up there, he right? He ended up coming out, you know, he's 640 some square miles. So mayor's at a all parts of the of, city, yeah. And so that's what but, we do. But Channel Eleven was there. They were so, they were yeah. there doing doing their thing. Yeah. Uh, they have a job to do, and we did ours. We made sure w before Channel Eleven even reported, we had uh, large dump trucks out there just getting yeah. people to safety because we had to use vehicles that were able to, to go through the water. And so just to love the people, making sure that everyone's okay, uh, and that that effort continued for. And actually, we stopped the official effort probably about a month ago. But we were transitioning people from those places to the Greens Point Mall, from Greens Point Mall to the uh, M.O. Campbell Center, from M.O. Campbell Center, Center, Center and to um, hotels. Yeah. And we started a re relief fund. Uh, once again, we had to go out and ask other people for checks to help the city. Yeah. And so, yeah, it was about just compassion and love. Well, I, I mean, I was very proud of you when I saw Thank that. You. Uh, because the idea that as a leader, not only get, will you sit in city council or within a nonprofit say we're going to change things, but you were actually out there when you saw people needed help. Yes, sir. And I think that was a big deal. That was a big deal to, for me to see that. So thank you very much. I want to I want to ask you one of the big debates often in this class and in this program of nonprofit. There are a lot of people come into this program and they say, you know, I, I want to get a master's because I want to start my own nonprofit. But a lot of times, what we hear from nonprofit leaders, right, is, no, don't start your own nonprofit. There are too many of them. Just work in some of these other nonprofits. But you went out, and, and early on, I remember when you were doing this, you, you said, I'm going to start my own nonprofit. And tell me about sort of the trials and tribulations. Was it easy? And would you recommend that people do that? Because you had a number of things going for you as well. Correct. Well, one of the things I, I did... Um 
the gentleman by the name of uh, Reverend Leslie Smith. Oh, yeah. And at that point in time, his nonprofit was FUSA, F-U-U-S-A. Yeah. And um, families under urban and social attack. Yeah. Now it's called Change Happens. Yeah. Um, great marketing plan to change the name. <laughs> <laughs> so that's one thing you all need to understand, your name and how people identify with it. Well, so Reverend Smith allowed me to be on his board. Yep. And I took it as an honor, even though my job was to go out and raise money as well and, and look at the organization as a whole. But he allowed me to take a look at the back, behind the scenes, the operations, the fundraising, and you know, and how what direction they were going in and how to assess what direction they needed to go in. Mm -hmm. And they were located in the Third Ward community, and they acquired a lot of lots, a lot of land, bacon land, uh, crack houses, as he yep. described them, and he ch began to transform that neighborhood. And so I had a back door, inside um, view. And so from then it was like a test run for me. And from there I said, okay, I can do this. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I wanted to figure out, because the, the, the things he wanted to do and he was doing, and I identified other nonprofits around the uh, city that did things that I was, um, I guess, engaged in, passionate about, yeah. concerned. and but no one was really doing literacy like we were doing it. Yeah. Um, because there were statistics out there, you know, I'm the youngest of three brothers, uh, my oldest brother Anthony, my brother, middle brother Marcus, and myself. Uh, there were statistics out there that would state, that stated then, and it's pretty much the same now, that one out of three African-American males will be incarcerated mm. if they can't read by the third grade. Yeah. As a former basketball player and now coach, you have half times. And if you looked at any game, football games this weekend, like University of Houston, Florida State, Florida State. they were losing the first half. But yeah. as a coach, you, you went back into the back room, in the locker room, and you said, look, this is not working. Yeah. Let's change the game plan. And they won. Mm -hmm. They won those games. So why can't we identify the problems now? And let's call a timeout, let's do this halftime or whatever it may be, and making it better. We pushed in classrooms, we had uh, opportunities at HISD, and we began to make kids literacy, uh, they improved their literacy school skills in these classrooms. And, it and you guys the, struggled at first, though, oh, we as, did. A, as a nonprofit, we did. right? We it did. wasn't like it was immediately successful. So we had, so I mean, I, I remember early on that yeah, we, we struggled. it the was first, tough. The first year, we, we got a little help. I cheated. I'm mean, going to tell you, uh, um, at the Breakfast Club, we used to... Um, uh, work with Shell, so with yeah. a gentleman by the name of John Hoffmeister. I remember that. John turned us on to uh, uh, the president had just signed, okay, a million, uh, I think it was one point some million dollars for the city of Houston uh, for the floods yep. from the people from Katrina. Well, he steered us in the right direction. So we were able to get $250,000 off the bat. And so, we, again, Mr. Hoffmeister, if you're watching, thank you so much. <laughs> Have you seen him lately? I, I, I saw John probably about a, a year and a half ago. Yeah, okay. Um, at the Houston, I mean, the, yeah, Houston Urban yeah, League yeah. event. Because I haven't heard from him very much. He's, he's out there, yeah. you know, he, everyone wants him. He's a big, smart, a smart man, and he's yeah. giving all information about energy and oil and gas, yeah. and so that's what he's doing yeah. now. But from there, you know, it went down. Mm -hmm. And then we had to go and begin to knock on doors and fundraise. Again, I cheated a little. Uh, we had a gentleman by the name of uh, Andre Johnson. I don't know if you heard sure. of him, he played for the Texans. <laughs> uh, he came to my first, my first fundraiser. Yeah. He did it across the street from the Breakfast Club. Yeah. And he allowed us to auction off a, a lunch with him. And He's a uh, humble sort of guy too, he, right? Very, very much so. Um, one of my neighbors uh, used to be the, uh, still is the uh, uh, general counsel for the Rockets. So we rock his paraphernalia and yeah. we, you know. But, but you weren't really cheating. I mean, no. you're were, you were using everything at your disposal, right? I used my right? resources, correct. Yeah, correct. exactly. Correct. And, and I, the idea that you were part of the Breakfast Club, which some people see as one of the more successful restaurants in town and sort of a unique restaurant, that had to help as well. Oh, uh, it did. Again, the Breakfast Club actually, again, that's why I've had, I had a lot of my encounters. Yeah. Uh, but also, we're able to, we were able to lure people to an event, a fundraiser that was hosted at the Breakfast Club. Mm -hmm. they, they figured, man, I can't get there on Saturdays. Well, I can go Thursday night for this fundraiser. Yeah. Um, and using the stationery, uh, partnering with the Breakfast Club, that it was instant uh, 
I guess, validation, if you will. Sure. Uh, that group weren't a fluke. Right. And uh, so, again, using your resources in different areas, you've got to capitalize on that because that's the only way you're going to be successful. And I remember going with you to Austin. We brought you along while Children at Risk was lobbying. That's right. And everyone knew you because of the Breakfast Club, yeah, right? Yeah. That's how they knew and they uh, knew your yeah. dad. And, yeah, they, and they called me, I think, I'm, I'm Marcus' brother. You know, when I became <laughs> council member, I started to put Jerry Davis, Marcus' brother, uh, <laughs> the Breakfast Club District B council member. But anyway. <laughs> Uh, so, so to answer that question, though, would you recommend that someone start their own nonprofit? So, uh, you have to have that plan. Yeah. That plan. That again. That goes back chapter to that two. Plan. Chapter yeah. two. You must have the plan because um, you know, city of Houston. You were diversified. We have a diversified economy, but we're still oil and gas. Mm -hmm. And so, when oil went down from a hundred some dollars a barrel to about thirty some dollars a barrel, those checks stopped coming in. Yeah. And so you have to make you have to make sure those contribution checks um, are there. If not, you won't be able to do the things that you want to do. Mm -hmm. So oftentimes, and I, you can follow my, my, my route, partner, team up with a nonprofit that's already there. And it doesn't have to be a 100% match, yeah. but the thing that you're passionate about, if they're doing it, see how you can volunteer, maybe serve on the board, do whatever, or maybe even perform a service for them as a vendor. Uh, just understand what's going on. And, and nonprofits are extremely collaborative. I mean, there there are a few that don't play well with others, and we sort of know who they are. But most nonprofits sort of want to work together, right? You have to because donors like to see yeah. the collaboration. Yeah. They want to see that their money is being stretched as far as, as possible, just like they, they see their money in the company. They, so they're good stewards of uh, their hard-earned dollars. And so when you partner with, uh, so for example, uh, we have our Walking Towards Literacy. Yep. Um, in October, we're doing a, a read along District B on September the 30th. But we're partnering with the Houston Center for Literacy, uh, making it better, and all. Uh, what else? There, there's some more literacy. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't have it in front of Houston, me. Houston, is it the well, Read Commission? That, that's the Houston Center for Literacy. Okay. We changed the name. Yeah. But they have a, a bunch of, of vendors, adult literacy uh, workers, and we're you partnering. with the Barbara Bush Foundation as yes, well? Yes, yeah. making it better. We're working with the Barbara Bush Foundation. And from there, when we send out stationery, and you see all of these literacy things, automatically, boom. So our yeah. walk, our walk is funded without a problem. Yeah. Uh, and we have kids that don't pay, it's like a fall festival, if you will. Mm -hmm. But during the week of September, the month of September, you have to read. Mm -hmm. And then those nine schools, elementary schools in District B, they're calculating the, the time that they're reading and then we're moving forward. And if you were a part, a participant, you come to a free fall festival. So we have hundreds of kids, uh, and that's where the collaboration comes now within the city of Houston at the park. We have Jumpies, uh, we partner with McDonald's, we partner with uh, different uh, amusement uh, uh, things, um, companies throughout the city, and we're able to actually push forward when we collaborate. And because there's no point, we just did a, um, a backpack giveaway in September. So again, we had uh, McDonald's, we had about three churches, and they, one of them had uh, $5,000 worth of vouchers. Mm -hmm. um, we had my favorite, my favorite um, Texas Children's Health Plan. There you go. Uh, they partnered with us. Uh -huh. uh, WAIT is a nonprofit that we, that's been started in District B. It stands for We Are In It Together. Oh, yeah. And we're able to touch different people and come together. And your dollar goes further, and, and the kids love what, what, what we're able to bring to them. Yeah. What would have happened, Jerry, if you wanted to start a nonprofit and you didn't have the Breakfast Club and you didn't have connections like John over at Shell? I mean, you're just a guy now and you want to start. I mean, what, it would have been significantly harder. Oh, uh, definitely. Yeah. Because I, I can't perform any services yeah. if I don't have any money. Yeah. So I, I had no experience in grant writing. So who's going to write my grants? Mm -hmm. And I'm going to get pissed off because I'm going to write several grants and get denied. Will, and, and, right? and even yeah. when you hire a professional grant writer, it's still like mining, mining for gold. You know, you have to go through a bunch of coal, a bunch of rocks, whatever, before you find that small nugget. And, and so mostly you don't find small nuggets. Most you don't. And yeah. it's very hard. And if y'all don't, if you dive when you turn it on, um, I think it's uh, 
National Geographic, they have this mining company. I'm sorry. No. It's mining, <laughs> this is a mining show that I watch every once in a while and, and when I can't sleep in the middle of the night. Is that Gold Rush? Is that yeah, some, yeah, 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 yes, yes, <laughs> Gold Rush. When I can't sleep and I'm thinking my check's coming in, but no. Yeah, that'll put but you, you <laughs> But you have to, I wouldn't have been successful. And yeah. I'll tell you another, another uh, advantage that I had uh, besides the Breakfast Club, besides city council member, I coached a sport called lacrosse. Yeah. And I played it in high school at Lamar. So if you, if you attended Lamar High School, big shout out to the Texans. Back then we were the Redskins. But <laughs> uh, I was able to, that's a sport that, it's not a traditional sport in Houston. Yeah. And so to, to have, to play this sport, you need some money. And you were sort of a star in lacrosse. People yes, know sir. you as being very good at lacrosse. Yes, sir. Yeah. Went to Maryland, played in Maryland as, long, as yeah. well as basketball. When I came back home, I, wanted, I, I was passionate about lacrosse. Yeah. And I started coaching lacrosse. And again, I, at my high school, Lamar. And, you know, Lamar's in the heart of River Oaks. Yeah. So you had parents that would come and, you know, pay me for one-on-one -on -one lessons. Yeah. And I'm like, this is crazy. But they have the money. And so the relationships that I was able to build as lacrosse coach, that they sowed seeds into the to, so, to so nonprofit. In many ways, it's about relationships that you have going in. Most definitely. And, and sometimes it's relationships with the right people. With the right people. Because a lot of people want to see you succeed. If you have a lot of friends, a lot of people want to see you succeed. But there's a certain group that has to want to see you succeed. Those that can help you raise money. Correct. And big, big amounts of money. And, and big amounts of money. Or they could sit on your board. Yep. Um, they... And if they can sit on your board, they may know other people or other companies. And once you get one or two, then that's, you just have to make, string them along. When you yeah. get one, you have to add another light to it, another light on the string, and you have to make sure you're doing it. And I'll tell you, we started uh, 10 years ago mm -hmm. um, in 2016, excuse me, 2006. Yep. Officially. Besides the influx of capital from uh, Hurricane Katrina. Yeah. We we did about a hundred. We added about another hundred thousand dollars every year to our budget. So we went from like a hundred. It was like it was about sixty something. Then the next year we were worried about a hundred and something. Uh, then we went to three hundred. Yep. And about er, every year after we added a, a, a hundred thousand dollars. So this year our budget, um, the board is going to vote on it. Um, I guess within the next week or so, a million dollars. Yeah. So we're operating. Uh, you know, some people say, "Oh, that's small." Yes, it's small compared to like uh, United Way, or it's small compared to like neighborhood centers. But when you have a grassroots uh, nonprofit, a million dollars is a nice. It's substantial. Yes, because you have. A, a good giver is between five and twenty-five thousand dollars. Right. So you add up five and twenty-five thousand dollars to get to a million, and you have we have very you have a lot of good givers. A lot of good <laughs> givers. We have very few grants as it relates to uh, uh, you know seventy-five thousand, and then it's hard to get into those doors. I mentioned earlier about grants. Um, you have to know people because they have a board and. You think your your idea for your nonprofit is great, but guess what? The person over here, he thinks or she thinks right. they're nonprofit, right. and all and, and, and all of them are needed. Yeah. But it's about again that relationship that you're able to establish with that nonprofit, that foundation, or that giver. And, and, that's I, and I think looking for that uniqueness in your in your uh, nonprofit is very important. Correct. Right? I think just the idea that. I think I could do a better nonprofit than you. That you know, there are five that are doing exactly the same thing. Is really not enough. Correct. Because you need to have some sort of uniqueness. You have to. Let me ask you: When you look uh, at the field of nonprofits in the city of Houston, are there a couple that you think, oh, that's a good nonprofit? I mean, they know what they're doing. They tend to be doing a pretty good job. Okay, so I'm going to say this one, and I hope no one gets upset with me. Neighborhood centers, they do a good job, mm -hmm. but they're, to me, they're too big. Mm. I, I don't understand how, it's a corporate corporation. Mm -hmm. I, don't understand, I don't see the passion, but I'm not saying the people that work there, they don't have passion, right. but it's like a company. I like the boutique. Yeah. I like to be able to change. If, if I'm noticing that I have a different set of children this year and that's something different, well, all you have to do is go back to that board and ask the board to, you know, change the scope or whatever that you're, mm -hmm. of the services that you're providing. 
Uh, it's, a, it's somewhat different, you yeah. know, and uh, they have big names. Yep. Um, and so their board is not as uh, personal. Right. So, but they have, but they're doing a great job. Um, I sit on the Houston Galveston Area Council um, board and for um, uh, workforce development, they were cut a $150 million check mm -hmm. for a year. <laughs> I was like, wow. I mean, and that, you know, so they, again, so my one million versus that, and that's just one. Uh, today at city council, we just uh, confirmed uh, a few million dollars for their Mills on Wheels project. Mm. And that go, they'll go into our uh, all around city of Houston some in, in an area like our community centers and feed our seniors yep. and some people who are stuck at the house and can't get out. So they, they, they have a great concept, if you will. And so if you look for big business, that's one. You have uh, my, my great friend and mentor, uh, Scott Van Beck. Yep. Uh, he has the he's Houston A-plus Houston Challenge. Houston A-plus Challenge. And he's actually able to go out into certain areas and come up with strategies that are solutions to problems. Mm -hmm. And so they started maybe, you know, and I think they've set up to two different, um, two different nonprofits as well. One for the charter school that they right. have and one was a traditional yeah. one. Yeah. And so they're looking at, uh, again, constantly looking at strategies on how to fix Houston's problems. Yeah. And so, around education. Uh, around education, yeah, forgive yeah. me. Yeah. So those are, you know, those are two different ones that I, they, they hit the mark. Mm -hmm. And then again, and this is the other one is called making it better. I mean, they've hit the mark <laughs> and then, you know, but those are the, you know, from two different facets, you get to see success. Yeah. So. And you can see some of the, so big nonprofits, you know, Rice University, Texas Children's Hospital. Correct. And they're, they're sort of an interesting, but we almost see them as sort of a big corporation also, correct, right? Correct. A lot yeah. of our hospital systems uh, are nonprofits, and right. so they're able to. And 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 the the one good thing about that, um, if you were starting a nonprofit, you you should have a for profit and a nonprofit. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason I say that, if you're doing for profit items I ideas, and you uh, services, you can actually have the nonprofit to write the grant to collaborate with you. And you're able to do both. Sometimes, you know, if you look, if you, and an example of that is if you have a, uh, a daycare yeah. or early learning uh, yeah. education center, you can do a sliding scale for people in the neighborhood um, that need assistance. But, you know, because it, it's better when the, when the families have skin in the game. Yeah. But if they're paying 100 bucks a week, that's not enough to give great care for the early childhood education center. No, that's right. So now, therefore, the the nonprofit will go out and seek um, grants, look for grants, and also seek donations to complement what's going on. And so that's one way of moving forward when you're looking at the early childhood centers. Let me ask you one quick question, and yes, I want to go to the Twitterverse and yes, get sir. some of the students' questions. Which is is more difficult, running a business like the Breakfast Club? Or running a nonprofit like making it better. I'm going to say a nonprofit is more difficult. Yes, um, both require product a product that um, both are going to require a product that you have to make sure that people desire. Mm -hmm. um, and I know every day I need to eat, yep. and so if I have the proper product, good service, nice price point, I can continue to do what I do. Now, the nonprofit, people aren't accustomed to giving every day. Right. And there are fewer people that give. Everyone eats. Now, you may not have the funding to eat at a place where it's $20 per person, but you still go to, let's say, a Popeye's on Tidwell and Homestead, a, a Breshire and Homestead, where on Tuesdays they're giving like three, two pieces for $1.99. You're still going out and eating, yeah, yeah. and you have a good product, and you have customer service. So that's why I believe the nonprofit is much harder because people aren't accustomed to giving all the time, and you, and you have to eat every day. You know, when it comes to Popeyes and churches, thank God it's Tuesday. That's <laughs> exactly. what I always say. You know? <laughs> so, uh, and, you know, and you mentioned service. You know, I go to the Breakfast Club, and, and uh, every time I go in, you know, Miss Jackie. Miss Jackie. She always comes out and gives me the big, huge hug. She's so So sweet. I love having her there, so... Uh, so let me go to the Twitterverse, and, and what we have are a lot of students that are posting their questions, so I want to get to some of those. 
uh, right off the bat. And let's see here. Um, oh, a lot of questions. Okay. Uh -oh. um, so what? So this is uh, Carol uh, Etuama. She wants to know what are some of the challenges as a leader on city council. What are some of the big challenges for you? Uh, so when I initially um, set out to run, to me it was simple. I said I just want to do this, and I just want to do what's right by people. Now, uh, what's right for you? I think it was like with different strokes, and I think the song was, was what, what might be right for you may not be right for some, mm -hmm. and that's true. Um, I'm a conservative mm -hmm. Democrat because I love social issues. Yeah. But as a businessman, I like to look at the bottom line because sure. that's what counts as, as far as being successful. Sitting on council, you have some people that believe that our money that we collect tax revenue should not go towards areas like education. They believe that's a school district's issue. Um, I don't think so mm -hmm. because if you're upset with us locking kids up and saying, man, this costs too much to you know house inmates. Well, if you put a couple of dollars on the front side and help them and prevent them from you know going down the wrong path, then we won't we won't have to build another yeah. jail or we won't have to team up with Harris County. And so that's going to be the hardest issue, I guess. Um, different perspectives from different neighborhoods. And you, you you're looking at an area where I grew up in again, Northwood Manor, where we had North Forest Independent School District, yep. which, which was taken by uh, HISD. And I'm not going to say given it was taken. Um, <laughs> Uh, but but you turn around and you look at Cashmere Guard Cashmere High School. They the TA brought in a, um, I know and a conservator. And so the point that we were trying to stake was like, guess what? HSD take care of your own schools before you come and take care of this one. But my, I'm sorry about yeah. that. I could went off. Yeah. But my point is, it's an area where I've lived. And I think I kind of know what some people need. I'm not saying the handout. That's where right. the conservative part comes in. Mayor Turner has appointed me as um, the uh, committee chairman for workforce development. And so we're working with HCC, Lone Star, and all the other entities out there to try to figure out how do we people, teach people how to fish. And so, exactly. and that's, that's where I believe that the, the challenges come in by having some of my more conservative counterparts on council to get in with me to say, hey, look, yeah, we're going to give half a million dollars to uh, uh, after school programs. I, I think also in regards to this, I think there's going to come a time when cities in Texas, while you say we don't do education, you're going to have to do early education. We are. You know what? And I want to figure out how I lead the champion, uh, lead the cause for increasing the sale. I'm, I'm saying it now, uh, adding a penny tax so we can fund early childhood well, education. Well, we need to work together on this because yes, I think Okay, this well, is... I'll take the back seat to you, doctor. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're going to have to do some leading, too. Okay, I will. So, uh, okay. Uh, J.J. Bannister wants to know, council member, what, uh, what was for you the most difficult obstacle in founding Making It Better? Is there, was there one most difficult obstacle for you? Uh, I will say yes not knowing where to deliver services because there's so much oh, yeah. need oh, so where, yeah. to, where to start where do i start so and instead of having the broad mission how do you pick that yeah, sort of narrow spot? so do i start you know and when, right i started this nonprofit shortly after my dad was killed yeah. and and he was a reading specialist mm -hmm. uh with north forest independent school district and so i i wanted to go to north forest and work with those kids again because i knew that was the area but I used to teach and be the dean of students over in the West Side, mm -hmm. and so there was a feeder pattern that already that was already yeah. established. Yep. And so, and, but the question was, where can I get support and resources more on the West Side? Mm -hmm. And so you add all these things in. That's where they were uh, pushing the money for um, Hurricane Ike, yep. the the whole shebang. So that, but where to start was my one of my most challenging that was your things. Big thing. Good. Uh, JJ has another good question. We'll try to keep the answers briefer so we can get to Sorry. more. No, no, that's okay. It's, it's, I'm enjoying this. Uh, so JJ wants to know, uh, 
what do you think makes a nonprofit great in comparison or to one that is good? That's a good question. Yes. So what's great compared to good? Well, first of all, you are reading the, the uh, good to great. Good to book. great. Yeah. So you're always going to think what you're doing is great. Okay. And yeah. I may say, oh, yeah, that's good. But the, the difference is going to be to some people, like a business person, my outcomes. How many kids are we getting that make, making them better? Are we getting, uh, making them proficient, more proficient in reading? And you, you can do it and you can become a great, a great organization by, if you're, again, if your thing is literacy, mm. drilling deep down into a school, trying to make sure that that school, that no one is reading below grade level. Mm -hmm. And so I would say, how do you make yourself great and what's greatest? But taking what you're doing and making sure that no one in the city of Houston is doing it better than you. Mm -hmm. No one. And to me, that would be great. So you got to concentrate on the little things that you have and understand all your data points to be able to report. You know, it will not help you read. That's less time you spend in the principal's office because now you're on track in class, mm -hmm. and so all your other grades, are, you know, your grades are, are, are improving in math because now you can read a word problem. So to me, making a, to me, making a well-rounded kid, that's great. It's interesting because it, also you see foundations talk about metrics, right? Correct. How do we measure? And so many nonprofits, they start up with this idea, well, for us a measurement is how many kids do we serve, but that's not what people are looking for. They want to see substantial, you know, these things really make it more kids, this many more kids graduated. Correct. There's many more kids are reading at grade level, things like that. And we're having to tweak some of our metrics as well because we, we have fewer numbers we serve. We yeah. serve because it's not about if you give me $1,000, I'm going to serve 1,000 kids. That's babysitting. That's YMCA. Right. You give me $1,000, I'll help one kid in two months. There you go. Okay, uh, this is Lauren uh, Schoonover. She wants to know, has there ever been a difficult situation you've had to work through uh, since being a council member, and how did you handle, what has been a very real difficult situation as a leader, how did you handle it? I'll tell you the number one thing um, was changing the, 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 the mindset of my community, of my district. Uh, previous, we've had previous leaders, and I'm not blaming anyone um, until I get off air. No, I've, we've had pre previous leaders, and Again, the one I, I mentioned earlier about the apathy. Yeah, we we've got to change that because in the city of Houston, we would use that data like from 311. If you if it flooded over here, call 311 and report it, and they would compile the information from 311, and that's what you know we need to go fix this drainage over here. But if my, if my district never never calls in, then they think, oh, it's not that's not a problem. No, that's not true. Mm -hmm. And so encouraging them to get out and get involved. And, 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 and to do it one more time, because you know what they've told me, the ones that are 70 years, council members, we've been doing this for 30, 40 years, mm -hmm. and nothing's happened. So it's been very fragmented about one issue, and then another person would jump on another issue, but no one's doing it together. So uh, T. Martin wants to know, um, that over the last couple of weeks, knowing yourself has stuck out as a real trait in leadership. So this whole idea of self-awareness. Uh, for me, as a self-aware leader, I know my weaknesses, and I have to figure out how do I hire around uh, that. How do you deal with this? I mean, is self-awareness and knowing yourself a big deal for you? Uh, yes, knowing my limitations is yeah. huge. And I'll tell you, uh, two ladies I want to say thank you to, that's uh, Kelly Bucote and Jackie Daughtry. Uh, they were both team, team mom from Westside High School. One I coached in basketball, the other son I coached in lacrosse. And uh, they pretty much run the show at making it better. Uh, director of Development and the Executive Director. Yeah, Jackie does a great job. And so I know I'm not going to sit down here and write everything down and check, you know, dot my I's and cross my T's, but Jackie does. Mm -hmm. And Kelly is going to do the same thing as far as development. I think I've received like two texts and an email with her in the last three days asking me one question because I hadn't responded. <laughs> and so, yeah, understanding your limitations, mine is organization. I understand that. And so the, the, mm -hmm. the best thing I can do is put people around me that's going to help me uh, be successful in, in that. So uh, Lydia Sims wants to know, uh, do you have any nuggets of wisdom? You have plenty of nuggets <laughs> of wisdom, but do you have any on maintaining a financially successful nonprofit? So what I'm encouraging, a non, the, there's a nonprofit by the, again, profit in District B by the name of WAIT, W-A-I-I-T. 
-hmm. and they're just starting up now. They just have one page on their website. There's no depth. But one of the things that they're doing, um, or they're going to plan to do, is try to figure out how do they build houses. If they can build houses in the community and build them at, at rate of X and rent them out for Y, that in, that's one way monthly they will have income mm -hmm. and coming. And so you, you've got to have some system of sustainability where you, you found out how money can come in annually, monthly, or whatever. It's just it, it's almost like and you you see this with a lot of nonprofit leaders. It's you almost always have to be thinking like a business person. You, you do. How do you monetize every little thing? How does everything contribute to the bottom line? And it's unfortunate, right? Because a lot of people think I'm gonna enter the nonprofit world because of my passion for Correct. homelessness or children or or hunger. But you always have to be thinking as the leader, how do we make how it you, work? And you could enter into it again, it, it, you know. You don't have to necessarily just have a nonprofit. You, you've got to think, like you said, as a, as a businessman or woman, as a for-profit and a nonprofit. I'm all about a sliding scale. Mm -hmm. I really am, but I know you need skin in the game. And so if it's building homes, rent them out to uh, the Houston Housing Authority mm -hmm. to where they have money coming in and we can work with those families with, this, with the resources they need, working with the city of Houston with wraparound services. You, you must, nowadays, you must find a source of revenue, and I say revenue, mm -hmm. to, to put together with your nonprofit. So Lashishi Taylor wants to know, um, when you have different points of view, and probably you see this on city council all the time, people with different points of view, whether they're in the audience or whether they're on uh, the council stands with Correct. you, how do you deal with these completely different points of view as a leader and to make it work for you? You have to put yourselves in their shoes. Yeah. That's the first thing, to understand what they're going through. We had a gentleman today on council uh, reported about someone building a... Um, a dirt mound where you're coming in, putting in uh, dump trucks. Mm -hmm. Well, guess what? 1993, for the, and the third time, the city of Houston voted no on zoning. Yeah. And so now we have to say, okay, so what else can we do? You look at our ordinances that we have now. But you can't, you know, just write them off and say, look, man, they voted for zoning, no zoning three times, so you just got to deal with it. Can't do that. You have to put yourself in that person's shoes and try to figure out how can I help them in their situation. It may not be exactly what they need, what they want, but if you can try to help them get to where, they, where they're trying to go, you're gonna have some successes. And then you gotta get something out of it as well. Uh, Mary Lane Ramsey wants to know, and this is a question that we often ask uh, our guests, is how do you maintain work-life balance? For so many nonprofit leaders, they, they do exactly what you just did there, Jerry. They just laugh because there's really no such thing for many. But do you have any work-life balance? I, I do. So let me go to tell you, my work-life balance is called mama. That's my mother. Uh, tonight, I'm able to be with you today, doctor, because every Wednesday, my mom picked, she will come and get my son, my two daughters, my brother's son, my brother's daughter and my oldest brother's daughter. So every Wednesday night she has six kids, her grandkids at the house. We're able to do certain things mm -hmm. and every other Friday night. So we're able to do balance our life. And then my wife, uh, she's here, she understands what, you know, the, the service that I'm, I'm trying to render. But also I try to bring, make her a part of the things that I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And so when we do these things together, mm -hmm. we're still creating family time. So if it's a backpack giveaway, my kids, they don't understand the difference that we're working, we're yeah. having fun. Yeah. And so that's what you have to put in there. Make your, again, I haven't worked yet. I've worked maybe two years of my life. That's it. And it because I try to bring everything together. And this idea of bringing your kids along, I mean, I did it throughout my career. My daughter now is, you know, she's 25, but throughout my career, she was always with me. So even right. if I'm working, to have her around makes a big difference, right? It makes a di big difference, and, now, and, I'll, and I'm sorry, I'm saying this, but um, in certain communities you know, that I've experienced, that I've seen, I've noticed, uh, more of the Anglo community, upscale community, the, you know, the dad may be in business, the son is in business, the grandfather was in business. Well, you know what, my dad was a teacher, my grandmother was a teacher, guess what, I was a teacher. We've gotta break that. 
There's nothing wrong with teachers, yeah. but the issues that you discuss at the dinner table, the issues that you, the, the, how your children see you, you're the model, you're the role yeah. model. Yeah. And so I try, try to take that opportunity to go out and show them different things. Um, my daughter speak Mandarin Chinese. They opened up for the mayor for Chinese New Year. Mm -hmm. And so I took the seat, I took the back seat. And I was given the proclamation. They kicked me out like they went on. <laughs> they didn't want to talk to me because they didn't speak English anymore. <laughs> and so everyone addressed my daughter. So, but we got to put everyone in, in leadership roles yep. so where they can understand that you can be that too. Yeah. It's great for those kids too. Yes, it is. It really is. Uh, Kelsey DePrado wants to know about board members. Uh, are there board members that you trust entirely and some that you don't? I mean, how does that work for you? Because boards, Boards with a lot of leaders, boards sometimes become, boards and personnel seem to be the two biggest concerns for a lot of leaders. Boards, you, I'll tell you, um, same reason you, you start a nonprofit, because of the passion, you have a reason. Well, board members get on the board for reasons as well. Yeah. Some just want to give checks and move on. Yep. Some just want to have some type of control. Um, but again, you must trust board, board members because the nonprofit is not your business. Yep. It belongs to the state. Mm -hmm. And so your, your job is to make sure your board, uh, as you recruit, you have great communication skills with your current board members. And as they go and interview potential board members, they will see a synergy. Um, a symbiotic relationship that can be established, and then you allow them to do it because, again, it's not about you, it's about the people you're serving, and it's not your nonprofit. Yeah, it's boards are, uh, they are I know they could be, you know, because <laughs> and as a leader, that goes back to your thing as a leader, you have to be able to step back and say, okay, yeah, exactly. Um, let's see, I'm gonna try to find a good sort of last question. What's your, uh, um, Naomi Panarello wants to know, within your nonprofit, um, how do you determine and consider whether things are successful? I mean, is it programming or is it checks? I mean, uh, it, well, it has to be both. It's going to be both yeah. because you have, again, successful, good or great, the question I was asked earlier. I look at the product, the end product, and I, I don't mean to talk to about a child as a product, but I just liken it to business terms. I look at my end product, the end results. And if they're achieving, it's like I'm a coach. Yeah. I take a student athlete who doesn't know anything about lacrosse, and when the course of the season, they score their first lacrosse goal, and they, in the middle of the game, they turn around and look at me, that's success. And that's one of the reasons why I continue to do this as well. Yeah. So uh, uh, an EAE wants to know, uh, an EA. She wants to know uh, your comment about neighborhood centers. Uh, she's thinking, well, the bigger you are, the more people you're able to reach and help. Is that not a good thing? It's a good thing. Uh, again, that's just not my, yeah. my good thing. You know, I believe sometimes you, know, you have smaller, you know, if you look at the city of Houston and the country, smaller businesses employ, employ more people. Mm -hmm. And because it's a boutique, you get to yeah. change things up. So I, you know, you can also turn on a dime. And do, you can, you know, Angela there, there's Blanchard. There's advantages to both. They, there's advantages to both yeah. because you know Angela Blanchard sits up there with a huge board. Yeah. And they they are big people throughout the city. And she's probably able work. to do some things that other people couldn't do. Oh yeah, yeah. I'm pretty sure she can. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so Amanda Salvador and Christopher Gilbert had the same question: Is there an ideal size for a nonprofit? Uh, I guess I, no. It's hard, isn't I, it? Because it, it, it yeah. depends what you do. It depends on what you do, and it depends on how you like to operate. Yeah. You know, you have some. Again, it goes back to some of those board members. Some of those board members they want to keep going and, and yeah. growing in scale. And there's a question: If you stop your data when you continue to report, if you stop growing, when then someone from, I don't know, the Kinder Foundation or whatever may say, yeah. well, well, what happened? Yeah. It, well, we didn't want to grow anymore. This is it. So some people may look at lack of growth as a negative. Yeah. So it's up to you and what you do. You just got to figure out how to keep continue to get more and, um, and it's, donors. It's, it's rare to find board members who don't want to grow. Even at organizations that are maybe the perfect size, mm -hmm. you still have board members who think we, we should be growing. Because we think when you're bigger, you're better. That's how we work in the States. Right? Look at Texas. Yeah. We're bigger and better. <laughs> Okay, now comes to our fun questions for the evening. Okay. Uh, these are our final five. 
Um, so your favorite restaurant in Houston? Okay, it's a place called Triple J's. It's a barbecue place <laughs> on Homestead in my district. Is and it good barbecue? I've never been to Triple J's. Okay. Are we going to meet there for lunch, Jerry? We have to. We wow. have to meet that for lunch. Triple J's, and okay, and there's another one because I have to go home to my wife. That's okay. It's called Burns Barbecue. It's over in Acres Homes. <laughs> so, uh, but Burns is famous. Right? Burns is famous. Triple J's, uh, they, they're getting there. They're getting and, famous. Well, they're there. I'm going to put it back. They're, they win a, an award every year at the Houston Livestock Show and Rodeo. Okay. So that's, yeah, Bur Burns and um, Triple J's. Okay. Well, very good. I love good barbecue. Yeah. Um, is there a, do you have a favorite sort of hidden place in Houston that a lot of people don't know about that, that you would recommend? A park or something that you... So, you, you know, I'm gonna, when you say hidden, it's going to be my district, and I'm biased. That's of why course, I, I ran for District okay. B for bias. Um, I love my district, and I have, a, a, you know, there's a place... <laughs> when I just need to unwind... It's a place called Mr. A's The Club. It's over in Cashmere. It's right down the street from my house. I just get to go and hang out with Mr. A and Mr. Is, Ashley is his name, and his, he was good friends bar? with my dad. It's is a bar. bar? Yeah, yeah. He was good friends with my daddy, and uh, so Do we hang out. you have a out. drink of choice, Jerry? Yeah. Uh, it used to be a margarita, but I'm, I'm gaining weight from all the sugar, so I'm kind of putting <laughs> that to the side, and I'm drinking wine now. But, that, but if we were going to go, like, Parks and Rec, that's yeah. in a place called Titwell Park. Uh, if yeah. you look around the around the city, all the lands like Sugarland, Pearland, Titwell Park is the ideal park. What they're trying to build. Yeah. We have an Olympic sized swimming pool. We had an Olympic sized diving board platform mm -hmm. when they took it out. Soccer goes, uh, soccer field, uh, baseball, softball, outdoor basketball courts, indoor basketball court, and we're right off the bayou. So you have you see nature at its best. Cranes, egrets, I mean, pretty much everything. And so that's my little place. I, well, it's a big park, but I love going to that spot. We just had the Olympics in Rio. Do you think Houston should have the Olympics in the future? <sighs> it depends on the cost and what we have mm -hmm. to put up. Mm -hmm. Because if you were to look at Brazil you know, and some of the, the, the structures they had to, to erect, what are you going to do with them now? Yeah. So the question is, at what cost to the taxpayer? We could almost tax? do it with what we have in place, couldn't you, we? You can do some things, and, mm -hmm. and, and, it, you know, and obviously the Houston Sports Authority, uh, Ms. Janice, she's awesome. Mm -hmm. um, I, if we're going to do it, she would be leading the charge. Yeah. Um, but I, I think it's a, it could be a good thing. Mm -hmm. We just have to figure out what okay. we're going to do with all the traffic. <laughs> and then our fourth question uh who's your idol do you have a leadership idol past or present i just you know but you know my dad's always gonna be number one yeah uh, and i'll say again go back to this guy named scott van beck scott van beck was my assistant principal principal at lamar high school yeah he hired me at west side as a dean of student uh students and um and he's always been giving me he's always and continues to give me information about you know education and in, in the nonprofit world. You know Scott's one of my drinking buddies. Do he you know is. This? Yeah, yeah. Oh, we, yeah. Well, I have a couple of tell stories to tell you. <laughs> I'll find. So we used to meet every week. I had martinis and he had beer oh, every yeah. week. We used <laughs> he's, to. He's getting so, too big for us. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, and then a final question: uh, When they make the uh, the Jerry Davis movie in Hollywood, <laughs> who's going to play you in a movie? Who do you want to play you in a movie? Oh my goodness. It's got to be somebody, someone who does not take himself seriously. Uh huh. Because um, it's not about me. I love to tell jokes. Uh, I think we tried, we pulled a joke on the mayor today. Uh, we, did? We, oh, we've been doing the, it for the last the eight months. The mayor needs jokes pulled. He, by he does. He does. Because <laughs> you know we, we, you know. So, but it has to be someone funny. I guess you know maybe Dave Chappelle. I don't know. Oh, um, Dave Chappelle, yeah. Because I, I think that you know that man. He's made history in the early 2000s. So mm -hmm. someone like that, I think that's about it. Mm -hmm. um, everyone probably would say Denzel, but no, he's going he's a little bit too old for me. So <laughs> I'm not that old. <laughs> but there's a lot of good actors out there. Oh, right? there's a lot of good yeah, actors yeah. out there. You have the, uh, and I'm sorry, I can't say names right now. Uh, there's a, the movie that's out right now. The, uh, don't worry about it. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, so, there's a there's a there's a lot of good actors out right now, and uh, and you know, 
I think Dave is going to, you know, he doesn't have to cut his hair. He's going bald like me. <laughs> he has a couple of jokes. He'd have to put on a couple of pounds, but that'd be about, that's about it. You're not going it. bald. You shave your head. That's I what shave you it, yeah, but yeah. God gives me a natural edge up. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Council Member Jerry Davis, my thank good you. buddy. Hey, thank you so much for being yeah, here tonight. I appreciate and, you. Yeah, thank you so much for everything that you do for this community. Yes, sir. And, uh, uh, you know, we love you. And so. I, I hope I've given someone some information that would tell you yes or, or no. No, this is a good group. and They got a lot of good information. Hey, guys, that's uh, our class for tonight. Thank you so much. Uh, keep up all the great work, and we'll see you next time here at the Nonprofit Leadership Studio.